with joy. Joy in the seven emotions is the only one that's outrightly happy, but joy can be broken down into lots of secondary or smaller emotions. Joy is the sense of happiness, and we might use words like pleasure or bliss or delight. We can also find things like amusement in this category, a slight humorous form of joy, or schadenfreude, the idea that you're joyful over the suffering of others, less of a socially acceptable form of joy. We also find things like pride, be proud of yourself in the joy bubble. But no matter what, joy tends to be associated with certain facial features. We tend to see the corners of our mouth go up, and we also tend to see a nice little smile with our eyes. It's particularly in the corner of our eyes, we tend to see them fold a little bit more. Our cheekbones also raise up a little bit. And so what's going on here with joy, it's very different from what we call a submissive smile. Sometimes we smile because we're embarrassed or we're shy or we're just trying to be polite. And those smiles tend to look a little bit more forced. We tend to open up a little bit more and we don't see the same creasing in the eyes. So there are some ways you can detect a genuine smile from a more uh, submissive smile. In terms of physiological responses, when we feel joy, our heart rate tends to slow. We have a sensation in our chest of our chest kind of relaxing and opening up. Our muscles tend to become more relaxed. Our tone of voice can go up a little bit, but overall our body seems more relaxed. And this more relaxed open state actually is tied to the fact that we tend to feel joy when we feel success. Joy is an emotion we feel when we feel we obtained a goal. That goal could be something like winning a prize, but it could be something like having a good day, having a good conversation, enjoying the person we're talking to, being on time on the bus, hearing a song we like. We could experience joy for lots of little and lots of large goals. And the purpose, the motivation behind joy is when you feel that relaxed openness. That actually facilitates us to broaden our attention, broaden our skills, and broaden our relationships. When we feel joyful, that's actually the best time to try and learn a new skill or learn new facts about a new area of knowledge or to help work on a relationship. We find that when you're joyful and when you're with people that you enjoy being around, you're going to facilitate bonding. So joy is really good, it's really adaptive, and it feels really pleasurable to be joyful. Not all of our emotions feel as pleasurable. For instance, we experience anger. We can also talk about it in terms of rage or mad or resentment. It can even be more mild like irritation. Anger is definitely associated with certain facial expressions. And true rage-filled anger, we tend to see the corners of our mouth go down. We also tend to see our eyebrows go down in the middle. And if you were to practice making an angry face, you might also feel the physiological response associated with it. I encourage you to try it at home, but just for a short while. If you were to make an angry face, even though you're not actually angry, there's this fascinating biofeedback pattern in your body. I felt a lot of heat right in my chest. I felt a lot of tension going right into my chest. I felt a lot of energy going to my arms and the muscle tension. My hands just involuntarily made fists. I never even thought about that, but they did. And I just felt like I was going to lurch out at someone. You also might find just by making this facial expression, your thoughts go to a memory of when you were angry. They're all tied together. Your facial expression, your body arousal, and your thoughts are all tied together. Now, why do we feel anger? We tend to feel anger when there is something blocking us from our goals. We feel joy when we meet our goals and we find success. And we feel anger when we think, whether real or imagined, there is a barricade blocking us from reaching our goal. This could be someone who's moving slow in traffic in front of us and we're worried we're gonna be late. This could be someone who is annoying us when our goal is just to have a quiet downtime and they're not letting us have quiet downtime. This could also be felt by activists and protesters who are actively trying to protest something that they think is a barrier that is wrong. There's probably activists you agree with and activists you disagree with, but by and large, when somebody is out protesting, anger is usually an emotion they feel. So what is the evolutionary adaptation behind this? Well, the reason why we have this angry response to an obstacle is by having this display of anger, it allows us to feel a little bit more bigger, a little bit more powerful. We might raise our voice, and our voice might get a little bit deep and more intimidating. And this allows us to attempt to gain power and control over a situation. If you get really angry and you yell at someone, you're dominating over them. And you're trying to take control of the situation. You're trying to control that obstacle that you think is blocking your path to your goal. So activists that feel like the government is doing something that's blocking society's path to one of their goals, they're trying to raise their voices and raise their awareness and take control of the situation. 
Because of this, we find individuals who have a larger desire to control are more likely to feel angry more often. So if you have a large desire to have control and have power and influence others and influence society, anger might be an emotion you feel more often. Now, related to anger, but still considered its own distinct emotion is that of contempt. This might be one that you're less familiar with. We tend to use it less in the English lexicon, but this is considered its own distinct primary emotion. If we look at the facial expressions tied to contempt, it doesn't quite look like a rage face, but it looks kind of annoyed. Like you don't want someone to bother you. They're irritating you. And so contempt is the idea that you are judging others as inferior. This might be if you have a coworker and they are supposed to doing a project with you and they hand you some work and it's really inferior work. You might raise an eyebrow, kind of a smirk to one side, say that's not very good work. And it's the idea that you're expressing in your facial expression that you're disappointed, that you dislike what they're doing and that you disapprove of them. The purpose behind contempt is it allows us to maintain the social hierarchy. You're not so much an anger trying to dominate and change their behavior, but you're letting them know that they are below you. And so if we think about it in social hierarchies, like a queen bee on the top of the ladder, that they are not as worthy as you, you are above them, they are below you. So it's, it's still a bit of a dominating tactic, but less severe and less potent than anger. And so this is the idea that if you're scrolling through your phone and you see something that you disagree with, you're like, oh, oh, that's so weird. And you might not comment, you might not dislike the post, but you might show it on your face how you really feel. Next up, we have another emotion that can sometimes be related to contempt. Contempt is often when you're judging a person, but when you are disgusted at something that's revolting, you're not gonna feel contempt, but you're gonna feel the emotion of disgust. And disgust really happens when you are around something that could be hazardous, something like bodily fluids or fungus or rotten food or vomit. And it's the idea that you are repulsed by it. I automatically just made this expression on my face, but it's the idea I'm kind of crinkling my nose. Uh, what, what you do in disgust is you, you close off your nasal passages by crinkling your nose. You're like, oh, this allows you to not smell the potentially hazardous contamin contaminated fluids. It allows you to be like, oh, and you don't want to ingest it in your eyes or in your nose. And so if you open up a fridge and you see a bunch of moldy produce or, or you're cleaning a public bathroom and you discover something that's nasty, this is an involuntary reflex in the face. And what it's allowing you to do is not ingest those fumes or ingest those molecules. So this is something we feel when we are repulsed by something. Now, some people can get contempt and disgust a little bit conflated and they can start to feel disgusted at someone that annoys them for sure. But disgust is usually around something more biologically disgusting and less socially disgusting, though there could be exceptions. Now, disgust is very different from fear. You might be disgusted by something, but you don't fear it. And you might be afraid of something, but you're not necessarily disgusted by it. A fear reflex is very different from a disgust reflex in that fear is the idea that it makes your heart go really fast, it makes your eyes open up a lot more, and it makes the corners of your mouth go down a little bit. So you're able to take in more information. It puts you more into a fight or flight response where you're ready to run away. It's very different from anger. Anger makes your heart go fast, but gives you more power in the upper arms versus fear. You can almost feel the surge of power in your legs where your body gets ready to flee the situation. So fear is the idea that your eyebrows go up, your eyes get bigger, and you begin to go into panic mode. Now fear is very adaptive. It's unpleasant to feel, but it's very helpful. This allows us to identify threats. It allows us to say, there's a bear, there's a tornado, what should we do? And it puts us into action to react. It's very adaptive because it allows us to seek protection and act much faster and on reflex than we would have. Where fear is not adaptive is when we have this reflex when a threat is not actually present. Imagine if you're sitting in your own home and you're safe, but you just keep imagining bears, or you just keep wondering and doom scrolling about coronavirus. Then you're getting a fight or flight reflex for no adaptive reason and you're stressing out your body for no productive means. So fear can go wrong in lots of ways when we let it preoccupy our life, when there's nothing we can do, to, when we can actively seek protection. But when we're actually in danger, fear is amazingly adaptive and very helpful, even if it is unpleasant. Another reason that we feel fear might be because we don't know if we're going to reach our goal or not. If you think back to joy being when we obtain our goal or we achieve a success and anger is when we have something blocking our goal, 
Fear might be when we're uncertain whether that goal is going to be met. And that uncertainty can cause anxiety and cause fear. We also know a lot of these unpleasant emotions can be intertwined. For instance, when you are very angry about something, that really intense anger might be because under the surface, you're actually afraid. And so you don't want to connect with fear because it's a more potent emotion. It's even less pleasant than anger. So anger is the more shallow emotion at the surface level you're willing to hang out in because underneath that anger is actually something you fear. For instance, let's say you're very angry at a politician who you disagree with and you're actively trying to protest their policies. It might be because if their policies go through, you're afraid of the outcome. And just like anger might be coding over top of our fear, our fear might be coding over top of our sadness. Sadness is the emotion we feel when we lose, when we fail, when we don't achieve a goal, or when we lose something that we're attached to. And so if you're angry at a politician because you fear what happens if their policy goes through, and if their policy goes through, you think you're going to experience a loss, uh, you're staying up in the layers of anger or fear because sadness is the most potent emotion we feel. It's the most unpleasant and it is the most powerful emotion we have experienced as humans. So it's hard to go right to sadness. It's a vulnerable spot to be and it can be a really devastating and dark spot to be. But it is important. Sadness is the idea that when we feel a loss, whether it's a loss of a loved one, a loss of a job, a loss of a material possession, a loss of an opportunity, these losses of attachments hurt and they hurt really bad that we need to take time off to reflect about that. Sadness is the idea that our eyebrows tend to go up in the middle and our eyes tend to kind of peek down at the sides and the corners of our mouth can go down. Of course, if we cry, we might have a variety of different facial expressions while we are shedding tears, but just sadness before the tears come in tends to be this expression of vulnerability. Now, what's really important here is sadness allows us to be still. It slows our heart rate. It gives us a lump in our throat and it allows us to reflect on this loss. Loss is important to accept and move past. We know that in grief, it's absolutely important to move through the stages of grief of denial and anger and bargaining to get to acceptance. And in order to get to acceptance, there's that other step in there of depression. You have to get through the sadness to get to acceptance. And it's the idea that you need to be able to give yourself time to heal. Now, what's really extraordinary about this is when we express the sad facial expressions and when we experience the sad physiological reaction, this actually signals to other people to want to support us. When they see a person with the slumped shoulders and with the peaked eyebrows, we're hardwired to want to help. If you hear someone cry, a lot of us have the desire to want to go and provide aid. If you ever hear someone fall down and start crying, many of us will run right to them and try and offer them aid. So sadness is the signal, I've lost something, I'm hurting, please help. And although it's very unpleasant, it's very essential for our well-being. We've actually found that individuals that are willing to go and show their emotions and be vulnerable live longer than those who bottle up their emotions. And so being able to express sadness is a skill that we work on throughout the life. There's social norms over what we can express. Certainly, in some cultures, it's okay to cry vocally and loudly in the streets, versus in other cultures, we have to be more withdrawn. But being able to express your sadness privately the way that you want to express your sadness is associated with well being. And finally, we're going to move to the seventh and last emotion on the list a bit of a lighter emotion to end off with, and this is the emotion of surprise. Surprise almost looks like sadness and almost looks like fear because the eyes are open, the eyebrows are up in the middle, but what's very different here is rather than the corners of the mouth being down, both makes more of a round opening rather than the corners of the mouth being down. And surprise is a very quick emotion. We don't stay in surprise for long. Surprise is often good, but can often be bad. We experience surprise when something unexpected happens, when somebody jumps out of somewhere, or we walk into a party that's going on and we didn't expect, or all of a sudden you might hear a big bang. Whoa, what was that big bang? And so it's not exactly fear. It's different from fear. It's, it's a startle, it's a shock. But the evolutionary advantage behind surprise is by opening up our eyes, much like with fear, we can take in more information. 
we're not alarmed, we're not as panicked as we are with fear. And you can feel surprised when it's a good surprise or a bad surprise. If it's a bad surprise, we often move from surprise to fear or from surprise to fear to sadness if it's a sad, bad surprise. But if it's a happy surprise, we might move from surprise to excitement and elation. So this was our unit on motivation and emotion. Hopefully I convinced you that each of our seven basic emotions have a specific motivation tied to them. And that many of our emotions, whether it's our hunger motivation, our desire for power or desire for self-actualization are also tied to emotions. You've made it to the end of unit 10 in intro psychology. Well done.